Greetings from Washington for everyone. It's a pleasure to uh, be with you today. So this project was difficult. Um, it was a bit more difficult than research generally is in this sphere, because in most cases, um, research uh, that has been done by think tanks and research institutions uh, has a foundation, is built on previous research. But what we found in our work is um, that there's actually very little close to nothing um, done already looking into the linkages between the violence-oriented right-wing extremists, terrorism, and organized crime. Um, there's some work on the so-called crime terror nexus related to Islamist extremism and terrorism. There's also some other work regarding other uh, political phenomena and organized crime. But here, uh, we felt like we are breaking ground, which is a privilege, but also very interesting. And that is also a theme, of course, that we are highlighting in the report. Now, um, as Hans uh, and Michelle have mentioned, um, we have looked into uh, seven countries, Austria, Croatia, Germany, Greece, Poland, Sweden, and the United States. You also see that we have a broad range of different researchers uh, involved and included, and I'm happy that Daniela and Cemek are, are with us today. So the key findings, um, we found that several um, right-wing extremist individuals and groups in Europe and the US engage in or maintain ties with organized crime. And of course, many of these cases have a transnational dimension through cross-border activities like the acquisition of illegal drugs um, or parallel memberships in different groups, even in different countries, uh, sometimes right-wing extremists, sometimes organized crime groups. In particular, um, we found uh, lots of outlaw motorcycle gangs that might not be a surprise to anyone who has worked on the issue of organized crimes, particular bandidos or health angels, but also smaller um, um, gangs in this regard. Football hooligan groups, um, often very well transnationally connected, um, um, have played a part here in the being right-wing extremist in their political views, but also being engaged in organized crime like drug, illegal drug dealing, uh, for example. And of course, that's a specific issue for the US, the white supremacist prison gangs. So there's a lot uh, going on in a, in a way, and we're gonna talk about dimension, quantity and quality in a second or so. So we found this all happening in particular in Austria, Germany, Poland, Sweden, and the United States. There's like a, a string of connections between Austria, Germany, Switzerland, Croatia, and generally the Western Balkans, in particular to the smuggling trafficking of uh, uh, weapons. And of course, there's a, and of course, I say, because it makes a lot of sense, there's a interesting Poland-Germany connection. So how do these groups cooperate or individuals cooperate? What do these linkages look like? So in, in, in several cases, organized crime groups have provided the illegal drugs and weapons to violent right-wing extremist groups. Here you see a member of the Bandidos, uh, Bandidos Berlin a Motorcycle Club, that was providing crystal meth, at least four kilograms, to a German right-wing extremist group that has morphed into a, one could say, Nazi mafia structure. And I'm going to talk about that specific case in a, in a few minutes. Then, of course, we have members that are, uh, we have individuals that are members in right-wing extremist groups and in organized crime groups. And here, this individual is uh, of particular interest in terms of, you see on his chest, his membership card, basically. So there's a football hooligan group here. There's a combat sports fight club here displayed, and there's a Bandidos logo. And what's missing is that he's also allegedly uh, uh, the leader or in the leadership of a right-wing extremist citizens militia in Germany. So this individual, just as an example, 
seems to be a member of four of the relevant groups uh, or categories that we've been looked into. Now, what do they do in terms of cooperation? For example, if they're not providing each other with, for example, drugs or weapons, um, there's services, right? Shared access to locations for specific events. Um, here we see uh, object 21 and Daniela is gonna talk about this in more depth. That was a network in Austria where then German th that was involved in organized crime as I said, Daniela is going to share the details, and they were hosting German right-wing extremists for concerts and other activity. And then, of course, there is um, the Turonen. That is the uh, group I referred to earlier, that actually some of their members have uh, 25 years of experience in violent right-wing extremism. And uh, at the end of 2019, the group, they call themselves Brotherhood Thuringia, short form Turonen, morphed into from doing, for example, large scale music events, which generated significant incomes and all kinds of other activity um, morphed into a uh, structure that was dealing with illegal drugs, that was uh, providing illegal prostitution services that is accused of money laundering, extortion, and so on. So in general, though, if we look at the literature and also in the publications of security agencies, the general assessment is that there's little evidence of systemic cooperation. Uh, this is from a, a Europol report on organized crime. And I think this, this statement here from the report is factually true because it also here focuses on terrorism, terrorism and organized crime. Um, this is a definition, of course, right? Uh, terrorism is a specific form of violence um, that is being uh, designated as terrorism. Um, we are at CEP also looking in, in politically motivated violence in a broader sense. So while this assessment is correct, there's also other assessments and also now our study that can make the case that there's actually quite a lot of evidence of systemic cooperation between criminals and politically motivated violence, which in some degrees can be considered terrorism. But as I said, that's a matter of definition and designation. Now here, the Austrian chancellor in just uh, two years ago, when a series of weapons caches were found uh, during raids, highlighted that there is a dangerous mix of organized crime and right-wing extremism in Austria. And um, as I said before, Daniela will share of those, uh, some of those details. So why would these groups cooperate, right? Isn't, isn't that a, a problem? Isn't that complicated? Isn't that dangerous for the involved actors? Of course, incentives and benefits are significant financial gains that can be used for personal uh, investments or for the furthering of the objectives of the extremist group, for example. Then there's uh, the possibility of sharing of information and experiences uh, related to law enforcement strategies. This is something we assume is happening quite frequently, especially if we have members who are active in organized crime and right-wing extremist groups, and obviously when they have morphed into hybrid organizations. Um, there's also a learning in terms of how to operate the allegedly legal businesses, because if you're involved in organized crime, you need to launder the money, right? So you need to have a set of supposedly legal businesses like restaurants, uh, legal brothels, uh, gyms, fight clubs, and so on. So how to do this properly, I think, is a benefit um, if you cooperate with uh, the professionals here. And one would assume that this is highly risky for everyone involved. Uh, for example, right-wing extremists being involved with organized crime or um, selling illegal drugs. When we look at the sentences that are being uh, passed by the... the, the, the um, the courts in, term, in, in criminal proceedings related to the subject, usually, usually the small fish are getting sentenced. So the, the people who are actually dealing 
Sometimes also leadership of an organization gets sentenced, but that is rarely the case. Um, we have not seen that a broader network was successfully investigated and taken down. So something that sometimes is being done successful in the fight against organized crime. So you go from the small fish to the big fish to the pond of the big fish, right? And you try to get the whole network is rarely uh, being done. and We've actually not found one case where a broader network involving right-wing extremist actors, organized crime actors and affiliates uh, were taken down. So there are of course risks, but they don't seem to be that high in terms of actual sentencing of involved individuals. So here are some examples how these hybrid groups who do both right-wing extremism and organized crime look like. So on the right side, you see classic mafia structures, the motorcycle gangs, you see the, the kind of crimes they commit. And on the other side, you see um, not yet, but in a second, the right-wing extremists. But before, um, again, illegal proceeds need to be laundered, need to be make, made look legal. So organized crime actors always have supposedly legal businesses, security companies, restaurants, they buy real estate or they operate brothels or, or and so on and so on to launder the money. Now we have the same thing with the Turonen, that case I mentioned earlier. There's another network that is not as strictly organized as the Turonen uh, in Cottbus there, there, where according to intelligence reports, more than a hundred people are involved so this would be combat sports uh, people, this would be local business people, this would be hooligans, this would be right-wing extremists, um, building a network where all this is happening as well. We have the Austrian case we're going to hear about, we have two Polish cases we're going to hear about from Chemek, and they do the same thing. So this is just to show that we found with our research a series of organizations and networks that actually do the exact same thing as mafia, but they are also involved or were involved in right-wing extremism violence as well. So assessment, this cooperation, uh, of course, between right-wing extremists and organized crime runs into some sort of ideological challenges, right? For example, if this biker gang is mostly comprised of people with a migration background. So you would say, well, how can these uh, wannabe Aryan super warriors cooperate with, let's say, the United Tribunes or the Bandidos or the Hells Angels specific chapters um, when there's, they're not really their people. But then again, you know, as a, as a group in extremism, terrorism, and organized crime, I think form follows function here. So you are pragmatic with your principles to grow your business or you to grow your group. So we see that these values and principles are being handled flexibly to achieve more operational progress. Um, and not appreciating that because we've seen that in some government reports looking at this saying, well, these groups are so different in ideology and background, it's unlikely that they will cooperate. I, uh, we would advise to reconsider that assessment. Um, however, there are significant differences between the different countries we looked into. So uh, in terms of how many connections we saw and how deep these connections seem to run. And this could be due to national differences between let's say Germany and Greece or Germany and uh, uh, Croatia, right? Where there's a specific local or national context developments, opportunities that uh, explain why there were so many cases in Germany. We found 28 organizations being involved in organized crime and uh, right-wing extremism. So having some sort of functionality in this context of the study. Uh, 14 of them since 2015, so just in the last seven years, 14 organizations that were associated with this topic. So this could be that there's differences because we rarely found anything in Croatia, the colleagues from Croatia, for example. But it could also be that there's an absence of targeted and systemic law enforcement investigations. 
And it could also be that there's simply no statistical category that could reveal such connections, right? So what happens if a right-wing extremist group is dealing with illegal drugs? Uh, law enforcement uh, identifies this, makes arrests. So what is this now? Because there is no statistical category for politically motivated criminals being involved in organized crime. So what usually would happen is that this will be handled as an organized crime case by law enforcement specialized for organized crime and for the statistical category of organized crime or criminal activities. So something could happen in reality, but it will not show up in crime statistics. And this is something to consider when looking at this. And this is why I showed you the cartoon at the beginning. So this guy is looking for his wallet. The policeman asks, where did you lose it? Is this here? He says, no, it's not here, but this is where the light is. So this is trying to make the point that law enforcement is mandated and um, uh, in a way limited to look at specific phenomena in a specific way. This is not the form of criticism because it's the same in science and in other research uh, capacities. We look at phenomena in a specific way. And if there's no statistical category that can show that the right-wing extremist group is also involved in organized crime, and in the process, they were being depoliticized. They're being handled by then specialized organized crime prosecutors and specialized organized law enforcement. Um, it could be, the statement can be correct and incorrect at the same time that there's no information or very little evidence that this phenomenon exists. Now, it, because we don't have the statistical category, right? So what cannot be displayed in, this, in the statistics uh, has a tendency of not being seen. We have these silos of focus and responsibility in law enforcement and prosecutors, which makes sense, but also uh, might allow for the actors that we look into to be between these silos. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. And um, we have an issue in general, of course, that law enforcement tends to look at the specific case with the objective to get a conviction um, and not necessarily into the broader networks. Sometimes in organized crime, of course, this is what law enforcement does, looking into broader networks. But in the countering or combating of right-wing extremism, that is very rarely the case. That is still a single case approach, right? So we see that there's a lack of up-to-date, in-depth analysis of the various financial strategies. There's no follow the money approach. There's very little learning uh, from how to fight organized crime, transferring that knowledge into fighting right-wing extremist uh, motivated crime. And this is just to symbolize this. So regularly starting from the bottom, the focus would be individual prosecution. Then maybe the affected or directly um, associated group would be banned. But then if you would use this in the EU context, it's called administrative approach, fighting organized crime, you then could see the broader network. So create joint right-wing extremist organized crime task force. This is one of the many recommendations that we do to find out, to highlight, to investigate uh, what kind of linkages do exist in the respective countries, right? So because the different silos of responsibility limit a holistic perspective of what is actually going on. At the end of such a task force that is probably timely limited, as all task forces should be, there could be an assessment that there's really not much going on, or there could be an assessment that there's actually a lot going on, but this was between um, the different silos and there was simply no statistics to highlight that phenomenon. And just to show that final slide, um, usually there's that the PMC is the politically motivated crime here, right-wing extremism, law enforcement part. You have an organized crime, financially motivated law enforcement part. You have the prosecutors and you have the tax authorities. And in between here is where these 
um, organized crime right-wing extremist actors operate. They try to live in the cracks between the different silos. And this is why we would need these joint task forces that for a specific time in the specific countries investigate what is really going on with our limited means, open source intelligence, media, government reports, we found a lot already in some countries, but uh, we are very sure that there's much more to be found. Thank you very much.